It's not paranoia if they're really after you. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Arthur Holland Michelle, writer and researcher, and founder and co director of the Center for the Study of the Drone at Bard College. Welcome, Arthur. Hi, Tanya. It's great to be here. Give us a summary of your resume, especially as it relates to technology. Sure. So I've been running the Center for the Study of the Drone, which is the small research institute at uh, Bard College um, for six years now. We do uh, mostly policy research. We've uh, examined a whole range of topics, airspace safety, counter drone technology, Amazon delivery drones, military drone proliferation. I've also written for a, a wide number of outlets, Vice, Wired, Al Jazeera, um, on a whole range of topics related primarily to drones, artificial intelligence, things of that nature. And then I have spent the last three or so years of my life writing this book, Eyes in the Sky, which is about aerial surveillance technology. Your, your first book, as you mentioned, Eye in the Sky, The Secret Rise of Gorgon Stare and How It Will Watch Us All. That's a little, like, that's a pretty exciting title there. This was just yeah. really... Explain Gorgon Stare and how does it work? Sure. So Gorgon Stare is the name that the Air Force gives to one particular type of camera from a whole sort of uh, series of systems that operate by a very simple principle, which is collect it all. So unlike a traditional drone uh, camera that operates sort of like a telescope, it looks at one small area of the ground in uh, very high resolution, uh, but in a very narrow field of view, these cameras watch an entire city size area at once, uh, often being able to track thousands of vehicles and people uh, simultaneously. That is the, uh, the key difference. And that enables you to uh, make sure that nothing is missed. So if there is an attack somewhere in the frame when you weren't paying attention, all you have to do is rewind and zoom into the imagery in that particular place and track everyone who is involved both forwards and backwards in time. And that gives you all sorts of leads to uh, find the culprits for these kinds of activities. What kind of resolution do these cameras achieve and what kind of detail can they discern from looking straight down in such a wide angle? Sure. So uh, these uh, cameras have a variety of resolutions. The, the biggest one, Gorgon Stare, has uh, 1.8 billion pixels. Uh, so, um, you know, that is however many, 150 times what you'd have on, say, uh, an iPhone. Um, that's enormous. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly gigantic. But as I said, because the emphasis is on watching the widest possible area, the resolution for individual targets uh, in, in sort of spy speak is just a few pixels because you want to cover much area rather than get, you know, a sort of larger resolution on a, on a particular object. So a, a vehicle might only be a couple of pixels. It might just be a dot on the screen, a, a person may just be a single pixel, but that's all you need to track that individual or that vehicle wherever they go. Uh, and then once you have a lock on where they've gone, then you can perhaps use another surveillance technology to actually say, get up uh, an actual identification on them, say by you know zooming in on them with one of those telescopic cameras. Let's take a step back 20 years. How did the 1998 film Enemy of the State influence the Pentagon to develop a high-tech aerial surveillance system? Sure. So I, I'm sure a lot of the, the viewers have seen the movie Enemy of the State. If you're trying to get a mental picture of what this technology looks like, it looks exactly like what the satellite does in that movie. And that actually is not a coincidence. So in 1998, just after the movie came out, a government engineer in California went to see that movie with his wife. And he saw those scenes with the satellite. And unlike the other audience members who were no doubt horrified by what they were seeing on the screen he was thrilled he thought it was incredible he started thinking about all the incredible things that the government could do with just such a capability and so he rushed home called his supervisor and said i have a great idea call me 
And that sparked off this effort to essentially replicate what the NSA in the movie accomplished with this fictional uh, satellite. And they originally did that by strapping uh, a few digital cameras together, and then the technology got more and more elaborate. As the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies start started to see that there was tremendous uh, power, if you will, in watching such a large area. So it really got its big break in 2004 when the CIA uh, started infusing the program with cash because they wanted it to uh, track down uh, people who had been planting improvised explosive devices in Iraq. And from there on, it's just been system after system uh, emerging, being deployed, often very secretly, with Gorgon Stair, this Air Force system that's aboard drones, being the most powerful system that has emerged to date. How did you go about conducting the research for this book? I mean, how willing were, were people to help you and offer up information? Yeah, it was funny. When I started working on on this book, the technology was known, but there there wasn't a lot of information about it. It was it was really secretive, very shadowy, and a lot of people said to me, "Arthur, are these guys actually going to speak to you?" Uh, what actually happened, though, is that everybody involved was very willing to talk. Uh, from that. You know, sometimes it was difficult to find them, but from a reporting perspective, it, it actually wasn't a challenge to get them to speak. And it turned out that the reason for that was in part because they're proud of their achievement. I mean, this is a huge technological achievement, what they've done. But more importantly, because they, they understand that they've done something significant, that this is a story that has broad societal implications. In in fact, one source that I tracked down when I finally spoke to him on the phone said, Arthur, I have been waiting for this call for the better part of 15 years. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, we have to answer for what we've done, essentially. Um, they knew that this technology would not stay in the military domain, that it would come back to the United States to watch us in our own backyards. And that is exactly what has happened. What in your research surprised you the most? Uh, you know, I, I, one of the things that surprised me the most was how far the automation of this surveillance had come along. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk recently about uh, Project Maven and Google's involvement with the Air Force in automating drone surveillance footage. But actually, there have been efforts within the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies to automate the analysis of aerial surveillance for over a decade now. Uh, some of these systems have been deployed. There are systems that can autonomously track those vehicles in the wide area imagery instead of having a human click on those little pixels on the screen. You can just do a computer. You can just have a computer do it. And that saves you tremendous amounts of time and allows you to do all sorts of more advanced analytical uh, work. Uh, it also surprised me that the tech industry, Silicon Valley, has been involved in those efforts longer than we originally believed. So uh, Google, it turns out, has actually collaborated with the Air Force on some of this work since as early as 2013. That is long before the news of uh, Project Maven uh, emerged last year and everybody was so surprised to hear that Google had been involved. Well, no, no, no. I mean, that was already five years in at least to their efforts uh, to help the Pentagon do some of this work. It's been 20 years. So clearly there are going to be differences. You've already outlined some of those. How does Will Smith's character in, in Enemy of the State mirror what someone might experience today? Yeah, I mean, it's there's a sort of inescapability to it. So part of what's so uh, anxiety producing in that film is that it really does feel like Will Smith has nowhere to hide. 
you know, he at one point he's on the rooftop of uh, of a building. They see everything he's doing, who he's meeting with. At another point, his nanny drives uh, around his neighborhood with him hiding in the back of the vehicle. The NSA tracks his nanny wherever she goes. Once they find out that he's at a gas station in the middle of Maryland. They can zoom down to that location. And once again, they know immediately where he is. And when I've seen this technology operating in the flesh, I've, you know, I've sat in on some of the live operations of US cities. Uh, it, it achieves exactly that. I, in, in fact, pitted myself against one of these cameras where I was in a vehicle on the ground. And I really did have this sense that it, it didn't really matter where I where I went or if I did a particular U-turn or drove around in this sort of counter surveillance kind of way, I would remain in, in, in the camera's uh, crosshairs at all times. Which is obviously an invasion of, of privacy, it feels like, right? But I mean, this is science fiction. So if how, okay, so let's talk about what it's seeing, but there's also this idea of prediction, right? So it's science fiction, but how might this technology enable governments to maybe predict future crimes like we saw maybe in Minority Report? Certainly. So, the, you know, if, if you can begin to automate the surveillance, then you can uh, get uh, a little bit ahead of the curve, so to speak. So I'll give you an example of that. Say you have an algorithm that's able to track very accurately the movements of a vehicle through a city. Well, we know that criminals uh, often exhibit very predictable behaviors in the lead up to a, a crime. Uh, we've observed, for example, that uh, before a, a shooting in the city of Baltimore, uh, a vehicle in, that is going to be involved in that shooting will drive around aimlessly, it'll do sudden U-turns, it'll try and drop whoever's following it. Well, if you can, in theory, say to that computer vision system, hey, tell me every time a vehicle in this city exhibits those behaviors, then in theory, again, you can flag anybody that may be about to engage in such an activity. That originally came from an effort to prevent these IED attacks from happening because, again, vehicles invo involved in those attacks exhibited some of those very same um, behaviors. If the system, even if the system only catches 20% of the vehicles that are exhibiting that behavior, that's still much better than not having the system at all because you are seeing unknown unknowns to sort of borrow a, a spy a spy term. Um, and maybe out of those 20, you know, just one is actually a legitimate criminal. But if you are just able to take a closer look, then you're really getting at what is the holy grail of surveillance, which is to see everything at all times. You can buy camera equipped drones today fairly inexpensively for just a few dollars sometimes. So what are the privacy implications there? I mean, what kind of regulations should we be talking about? So you're absolutely right that uh, it is nowadays very easy to get hold of this technology. Um, and the fact of the matter is that whether you're flying a huge military grade uh, wide area surveillance camera or a small hobby drone, uh, as long as you're observing the airspace rules, you're not breaking any laws because we don't have any uh, privacy from above because the sky is, is, is public space. Uh, that uh, standard of privacy was created before any of these technologies existed. So we really have to think about how to update those standards to better align with the technologies that exist today and also the technologies that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, you know, for other surveillance technologies, there is a warrant requirement that you can only track a vehicle persistently if you have some strong reason to believe that it has been engaged in a criminal activity and a judge has agreed with you. 
in that estimation. That would prevent law enforcement agencies from following uh, whatever random citizen they, they feel like. You could also limit the minimum altitude, for example. This is an idea that through a few people have thrown, thrown out uh, at me during my reporting so that you can't see anybody in really high resolution. Uh, you can ensure that there are safeguards around how the, the activities of the law enforcement analysts are logged so that every uh, surveillance activity by one of these analysts is tracked meticulously. And if they are following someone who is not involved in an investigation, say they're following their spouses, then that will you know, pull up some red flags and they'll be called out for that. These are just a few fairly simple measures that a uh, number of the people involved and also the advocacy community has thrown out. And I think those start getting us into a place where we can perhaps balance some of those negative possibilities for abuse against some of the, the positive potentials. I mean, you know, this technology can be used in ways that I think will benefit society, but only if we can ensure that those abuses are prevented. Arthur Holland Michelle, writer and researcher and author of Eyes in the Sky, The Secret Rise of Gorgon Stare and How It Will Watch Us All. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to get your book, Arthur, how can they do that? Uh, I think the best way would be to go to my website. It is arthurhollandmichelle.com. You'll find it all there. Sounds good. I highly recommend it. It's a very interesting topic, but you guys can find me and my interviews right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.